little crazy, little nutty <laughs> chick, look like to me. You kind of saw the nutty chick side of her. I got a lot of that. Oh. Did I look like an idiot because I cried? And <laughs> they bend your knees a little bit. And now lean forward as if you're going to do what's called a bent over row. So you're going to lean <laughs> forward about here. Right. From the famous Acme Theater in Hollywood, it's the Gregory Mantel Show. Today, Thomas Calabro, the bad boy from Melrose Place, is here. He's in the upcoming movie Locker 13. And later in the show, Emmy Award winning TV judge Christina Perez from Christina's Court and personal trainer John Salutaire helps you get motivated and stay motivated for your workouts. But first up, Thomas Calabro. Great to have you here today, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I just want you to know that Nicole from our staff told me that the reason she moved to LA is because of Melrose Place. The people <laughs> yeah. in Germany, she's German, everybody in, in Germany thinks that that is what LA is like. Oh, so, wow. That's frightening. So huh? you were spreading that image around the world. Yes, apparently CNN doesn't get over there, but uh, <laughs> Melrose Place does. <laughs> exactly. What does that tell you about the Pearl Harbor murder? But and it shows you, too, how what an influence that show has had. Uh, yeah, and being that it's like uh, 10 years later, I, would, I guess exactly. it has a strong long-lasting influence. But I want you to know she also told me though that the real LA does not live up to that image. So you actually kind of misinformed people about what it's oh. like to live here. <laughs> so uh, USA is not full of pretty people with petty problems. I, oh. <laughs> now, and do you agree? I mean, do you think LA is, does not quite live up to the Melrose, the real LA is, is just an illusion compared with? Uh, I wouldn't want to ever move to the place where Melrose Place is happening. So I don't know why anybody would want to go yeah, there. Yeah, Nicole, why did you so want to move here? That. That was, so I have three children to protect. <laughs> We can't have doctors trying to oust each other by poisonings and such. You know, that yeah, so, and you were the bad boy for sure on that show, right? You, indeed I was. Indeed I was. It was a lot of fun to do. Too. So it was fun to play that kind of a character. Yeah. yeah. You know, as originally conceived, I was supposed to be like uh, Jane and I were the married, sort of staid, go-to for advice couple. That didn't last very that long. That didn't did last it? very long. I mean, they were about to get, kick my butt off that show the second season. In fact, they, gave, they called my agent for the option. But just before to, to that kick happened, you, to kick you off the show, they did. They said, "Look, we don't," because I was contracted for a full all episodes every season. Mm. And the second season, uh, they called the beginning between seasons and said, "You know, we just want to keep Thomas for 13." Oh. So um, we sort of renegotiated a little bit, and um, but at that point, Heather was on, and they were sort of committed to being a soap. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marsha was also on. And yeah, we yeah. Had made the wise decision of uh, Marsha Cross. I'm talking about because the episode I saw, I was watching some on DVD. You were carrying on with Marsha Cross, so somehow oh, you went from this. Did quite a bit of carrying on. <laughs> <laughs> but so what happened? So then they. Uh, well, anyway, uh, I had played a scene with Marsha at the hospital, and you know, just talking it over on the sidelines before shooting. So let's just do it with a little flirtatious quality to it, you know. And between, I think, what the writers had in their mind and the way we played it, they were like, you know, that could really go somewhere. And that saved my job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and indeed, you were, um, what, the only character who was on that show the whole run. That is correct. I'm also the only character who had, had a 14-year career before that. That was my first show. I kind of knew the gravy train I was on, and I wasn't getting off it. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You know, it seems like I always say, you know, for bands, as soon as, like, boy bands, as soon as they hit it big, you know, then they break up, or any kind of band, you know, or yeah. TV shows a lot of times when it hits it big, and you know, all of a sudden then the stars want to leave. But you you knew the way this business, you thought, I'm staying. I'm going to ride this yeah, thing I mean, out. It wasn't just, yeah, it wasn't just, hey, you know, what are the, the odds of something happening like that? You know, the... Hmm. 5% of shows last more than the pilot. Oh, they're gone you know, before I mean, they even so, start these and days. Then 5% of those shows go more than one episode, one uh, season. So yeah, there was that. But the other thing was, it was a great job. Mm. I was starting a family, had plenty of time because we were a large cast. Even when I was in A Story, which I was, you know, much more so during the end of the run, um, I had a lot of time to be with my kids because we had 14 you know, six storylines to cover and hmm. 12 characters. So you didn't have so those stereotypical so long hours on the set? You actually had <laughs> you actually had free time? You weren't on the set all no, the time? About three days out of eight oh. on average show. Um, there were times where I worked more. There were times I worked less, little, you know, probably more than less. But still, that's a good gig. Oh, Gotta yeah. Gotta hang with that, <laughs> especially when you know, like to spend time with your children like I did. Well, it was interesting watching you with Marsha Cross, too, of course, because you're seeing her thinking, okay, I, she's going to become a desperate housewife, so. Right. Um, it's a different perspective now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but what, what, think of her the first episode of, um, of Desperate Housewives. I only saw, I think, one episode of it early on, and she had some crazy thing with the buttons, and she was playing, I don't know if she still does, because these things evolve and change, but she was playing a, a little crazy little nutty chick, <laughs> look like to me. And, um, you know, that's not unlike her training on Melrose. You kind of saw the nutty chick side of her. 
I got a lot of that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> now, are we talking on camera or off camera? Oh, totally on. <laughs> okay. So she was fun to work with off camera? She's great. And have you, do you, I mean, I realize people work together on shows. And, I mean, did you ever keep in touch or did you, was it just? You know, my, no, um, my best friends are uh, from the crew. Oh, oh. Yeah, they, I, I, I got along with everybody. Everybody was terrific I'm across the board on that show. Um, I keep in touch with one of the producers, one of our exec producers in the oh. last uh, few years, and um, the sound mixer. <laughs> Go and for AD is the first I talked to. Oh, and I just talked to the post-production editor, but all crew people. Wow. That's yeah, I'm a, you know, I'm a blue-collar guy from a blue-collar background. I, I just get along better with those So folks. there wasn't the us and them with like the crew, you know, the stars couldn't talk to... Oh, no, not at all. Not for me, anyway. And I, I, didn't get a, I didn't see a lot of that. And what about Heather Locklear? Sweetheart, lovely, professional, great to work with, easy. A doll. She is a doll. I, I, we, I, nothing like her on-screen character. Nothing. <laughs> and, and what about, you know, of course, that was obviously a, an Aaron Spelling show, and he did, mm -hmm. you know, obviously so many shows over the years. And, he sure uh, did. And what was it like? Uh, did you work, I mean, have much interaction with him directly, or was it You know, I did the... because um, I wanted to direct. Hmm. Um, I also did because we went through some periods of negotiation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he would never deal directly with Aaron. He was really interested in money, believe it or not. Um, but he was very interested in the creative. Hmm. And after I directed my first episode, I believe the oh. third season or so, he phoned me at home to say, I saw this episode and I said, you have to tell me who directed this. And I am so happy it was you. Oh. That was a great episode. And so, so you're interested in directing that too? Did you go on to do other I episodes? I was at that or? time. I did about five episodes of Melrose, I think. Um, and then I wasn't interested in directing television anymore. I directed theater. I, oh. Not since, but I was doing that back in New York before I came out here. But I haven't gotten back into directing. And I'm well, sure if I will or not now. You got the movie Locker 13 coming up? Yes, yeah, that. I got a couple of movies coming out. So what, what's this one about? I know, I, I know that it's what... Locker 13 is six different segments that uh -huh. all revolve around the story of this item, Locker 13. Uh -huh. And in our particular... Um, it's like one of these kind of crash movies, you know, where you got all these people coming and going or different... Uh, sort of, I think so. But they're all individual segments. Okay. Like Ricky Schroeder did one yeah, about yeah. a boxer uh -huh. and these gloves that come out of Locker 13 and their magical effect. Um, and yours is the author? Oz is the author. Author. Yeah, and um, you know, I don't play a very nice person in that either. Oh, <laughs> maybe I can say. <laughs> See, I'm seeing a trend here. But it's a little know, featured role uh, at the end. It's not the whole bit. Hmm. It's just a nice little scene. And so, what are you said? But other movies then too you're working on, or other things? I know you. Oh, uh, I did a. Well, I finished it without a trace. That just aired in January, where I play a blue collar New York guy, which is like going back to guy? my roots. Yeah, because you know, I started on the stage in New York. Really. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, I'm a member of the Actors Studio. <laughs> I know when you do Melrose Place, no one even thinks that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <clears throat> I'd sort of like to expand the thought of what I can do, because I did a lot of comedy as well. You know, I was here on State Saturday yes, night. Yes, you just were here at Acme Theater taping, and you just did a show with them. How did that go? What was uh, that like? Oh, it was a, lot, a lot, ton of fun. That was like diving out of a plane without a parachute. That's what that was like. <laughs> Because you don't really rehearse or anything. You just get out here and do the bits. They stage you. You know, we got stage. Whatever happens, happens. Came right? to the 4.30 it's on Saturday and finished the run through at 7.30. And they were telling me how to do the curtain call just about five minutes before we did it. Do <laughs> you think you want to do more, right, right more comedy or more theater in the future? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I will. And you were the understudy for Denzel Washington. Is that, that was one of your first? Uh, that's correct. And um, we went to the same college. We went to Fordham University at Lincoln Center. Oh, oh wow. Right and in um, I was in the Bronx campus at first because I was going to play football. That didn't work out. So I came down the second year and um, auditioned for Midsummer Night's Dream. He was playing Oberon. That's oh. a Shakespearean play. Sure. Okay. I don't yeah. know. I mean, <laughs> I'm LA, so i got to say it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> oh, I played the gentleman caller. Why'd you take this as a small role? Um, and. Um, uh, he was doing Oberon, and I was understudying him, playing one of the comic characters, mm -hmm. one of the mechanicals. And um, after about two weeks, he couldn't do it. He got a job in San Francisco, do something at ACT, I think it was. Oh. It was kind of a nice theater company up in there. And, um, and so I ended up doing Oberon, and I like I took a crash course to get rid of my New York accent. But Which, you did it. Yeah, to some degree, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know if it was perfect, but we don't have that on tape, so I can't tell you. 
instead of the English accent, you have the Bronx accent yes. with Shakespeare, you know? Right, exactly. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure. Thank you very so much, much, Thomas. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. We'll be right back. Sometimes it's hard to tell the patients from the perps, but that's just the way it is when you're trying to be a doctor and a cop. And we are back, and joining us now is Emmy Award winner Christina Perez from Christina's Court. Hello, Great to have Gregory. you here today, How are Christina. You? Thank you for having me. Here. And first, let me congratulate you on that Emmy Award. Thank you so much. It's, you were the best legal. It was the best. It's a uh, legal slash courtroom show, court show, um, and it was the first time the Academy had the category. And, you know, I think just because there's so many great legal shows out there and a lot of court shows, obviously there's, you know, 10, 11. So it, it was really amazing. We were up against um, a lot of the, you know, court shows that have been around for a oh, long yeah, time. Oh, yeah, Judge and Judy and all we those. We were the underdogs. Well, you found your niche then, apparently. Yeah, we did, apparently. And I want so. you to know, I watched your acceptance speech on did YouTube. Did you? Did I look like an idiot because I cried? And <laughs> no, but you know what, truthfully, <laughs> what I thought when I watched that, I thought, you know what, I'd be bald too. Yeah. I thought because I think people don't understand us because I'm sure for this when it's a light when you work on something and you grow a yes. project and build it and then you get there like I said I probably oh my yeah. god I can't believe it. you know what I mean because that you know it's all of a sudden know, it's there. It, it, it is it's emotional it's it's lo I love doing what I do and mm. I'm blessed to, to be able to have the opportunity to do it but it, it's just the partnership between you know, a show, I mean, you know, it's not just you, it's everybody oh, else. Yeah. And yep. if they love what they do, you have an incredible quality product. It doesn't matter if you've been on the air for one year, 10 years, you know, six months. It's the, and that's what comes through. Um, and we were pretty blessed that that, that happened and we're extremely grateful, so. Well, I liked your comment too when we were talking the other day. You told me that, um, you know, I hate to say it, but sometimes you think of these really hardcore judges, but you said, you know, you don't want the show to be a circus, you're there to help people. You know, that's what it is, law is, the greatest equalizer among men and women, doesn't matter where you are, what race, nationality, economic stature comes in, the law is supposed to be there to help you, to help you resolve problems. And um, if you are there trying or pretending to be somebody then you're not, people are gonna see right through that. If you're there with the purpose to help somebody, help somebody resolve a problem, then that's what you're gonna do. I understand it's entertaining, we gotta be funny once in a while, we we have to really let people come out, it's like interviewing somebody. Right. You have to let somebody come out of their shell in order to be heard or them to be heard uh, but it's it's a labor of love it's it's sure. it's really you know it's an effort between litigants and the bench and everybody now because it's TV though mm -hmm. um, we all know how that can be I mean <laughs> do the they question. you know I mean let's say you know you do think of some of these you're like I mean do they force you to be well, I'll say, do they do encourage they you to be a little more hardcore on some um, of the things you know or? sometimes um, the first year you know th th there was always a suggestion that I should do this but you know I've been doing uh, court shows since 1998-99 on Spanish language I was the first to have a, Span a court show in yes. Spanish language, um, and that that was for almost six years on the Telemundo network and 15 countries internationally. So, and that was just me being me. You know, I'm the kind of person that if you deserve a kind word, you're going to get it. If you deserve a harsh word, you're going to get it. Yeah. If you deserve tell it how it is. If you deserve to be told how it is, you will get it. But it has to be natural. I can't really air people out just because because people are going to see it's so fake. Um, well, and, so and we don't. Maybe in a way it's helped in real life. And the reason I say this. I haven't had many court experiences, but I went to traffic okay. court to fight Did this you? ticket <laughs> in Beverly Hills. And I have to, I don't, can't remember the woman's name. I have to give her credit though. She looks, I swear to God, she looks like Judge Judy. Does she really? But she was so nice. And you could tell because people come into, no offense, but because yeah. of some of these court shows, people, even for traffic court, yeah. people come in freaked out. They're thinking like, you know, this is going to be a mean SOB up yeah, here on yeah. the bench. And they were, they go, they are so, they try to, they go out of their way actually to be nice or to take away people's fear. And honestly, I thought they were so humane and decent. They really try to work with the people. Now, I, and, and you could tell she had a tough side. Like if you really messed with her, you mm -hmm. knew the, of course. you didn't mess around. But they but actually, you felt that, right? yeah. And but yeah. honestly, I think partly I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. But, but you know, they, I think because they think people are so scared going into yeah. court, you know, that they actually in real life would kind of pull back a little yeah. these days. And you know, at you least in traffic think, court, I don't but know. But no, but it's true. And you have to think <laughs> we are so litigious. We sue people for everything. Um, our you know courts are inundated with just crazy fr frivolous claims. And you, you must see the craziest cases. Yeah, I mean, it's like you actually filed this in front of a court, you know, because we get our cases from small claims courts, you know, throughout the nation. You know, like, what is going on here? So, you know, in, in a way, yeah, you want to entertain and, and, and teach people a lesson, but it's just, Well, it's when you like, mentioned small claims court, that was one of my other rare court experiences. And I happened? once in college took my bank to court and won <laughs> by default because they didn't show up like well met. But I will tell Which you, though, truthfully, it? sitting there watching that, though, if you saw this on TV, you would not believe it. Yeah. You would think that the people, even in traffic court, you see some of the wild 
wildest stuff. And honestly, on TV, I think, oh, this is so staged, this is so fake, yeah. they did this. It was just, I, and not knocking the people, I wish them well, but you just saw everything. It was unbelievable. I'm telling you, it's, just, so. it's, 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 it's what people always ask me. Uh, court shows are in the age of reality TV. It's reality TV at its finest. It's, so what was the wildest case you've oh seen? Oh, God, the think? wildest case. We've had pretty, a lot of, you know, a lot of really deep cases. For example, last year, the case that we won uh, uh, the Emmy for was a case about, you know, gun rights, you know, mm -hmm. the right to bear arms. It was about animal Now, you abuse, don't take away people's cruelty. guns in this country. No, 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 no. But the issue. <laughs> I mean, it was a multifaceted case that had so many issues, right. uh, but the core was animal cruelty. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have fun, silly cases where there were the best Tina Turner impersonators in Las Vegas were fighting over each other because one of them said, you took my uh, my thunder from the Sandra Bullock movie that, oh God, that old school. And so then the person I was haven't Tina seen all Turner. Of them, just a few. It was just, it was hilarious. And they were actually suing each other. They were like, you're, you've interfered with my right to do business. So who won that one? Uh, Tina Turner. Oh. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> one of the Tina Turner. One Elvis. Of the Elvis. No, one of, they, they were both lovely uh, female impersonators and they were amazing. Uh, but th there was nothing you can do there because, you know, contractually there was, you couldn't prove a legal claim, but they were serious about it. Then we've had fun cases, um, you know, with young kids involving kids where they come in and a neighbor said, that young boy, but it was a hole in her garage door and this little kid was like six years old, the cutest tiny little thing. Oh. So he came on well, the bench and talked days, to us. Well, these days, hell, they're murderers at all. I know, I know, but know, not I... this one. Th this was a pretty cute story. And uh, But, you know, we have great cases. Sometimes, you know, families divided, family tragedies, mm -hmm. uh, neighbors, uh, people who do contractual obligations. Eh, you know, now, we have I, a little I'm bit just of curious, with, with your background as an attorney and the, and the judge on the show on this, that you see so many cases, and I imagine such a side of people. Mm -hmm. What do you think about... I, I hear this a lot, and well, even sometimes, let's say in Europe, people talk about punishment versus like rehab. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot, you know, these days you don't send them to prison, you send them to anger management. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Do you, do you, does punishment, you know, do you send them to jail or do you send them to rehab or what do you think? Yeah, you know, I think it, the, it really depends on the crime, on the charge that uh, they're being faced with. But what you have to think, our judicial system, even though what we see a lot of the negative hype that we see in the media, you know, it's not perfect, but it is the best legal system in the world. I mean, if you think about it, it you know, our constitution is amazing. Um, and oh, it really is. It, 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 it protects everybody. Long, yes, I mean. exactly. It, 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 and, you know, the thing is that we evolve every year. Every, you know, as society changes, as legal needs change, it, it, it evolves with us. But, you know, you have to really look at the crime, the individual, is the first time, the second time, and then you really have to, according to what you can do, what the court can do, is, you know, I hate to use this, coin the, or use the phrase, you know, the punishment has to fit the crime. After a while, if you see somebody that committed something and they've got no record and they're a 17-year-old kid who's, you know, in gangs and it wasn't a violent felony, you know, a violent crime, do you have them serve time? Do you have them go to rehabilitation? So there is some so they mercy can become, with justice. It's yeah, not so just you can become a contributed member of society. I think it's, you know, it really depends on, on all these factors. But, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that we usually, you know, there's a lot of good people on the bench and a lot of great, you know, attorneys that help out. We can look for Christina Perez on Christina's Court. Thank you very Thank much, you Christina. Thank you so much, Gregory, for having me. We'll be right back. And we are back, and joining us now is personal trainer John Saluter. He's going to tell you how to get off your butt and get in the gym and get moving. Great to have you here today, John. Hi, nice to see you. I think that's the problem a lot of people have, is finding the motivation, you know, just to even get in the gym. And I know that's one of your things as a, as a trainer is, is motivating people. How do you motivate people? The really is the best way to get someone motivated is to get to the root of their desire to what they want to do training. A lot of times people are ambiguous about why they're going to decide they want to get in shape. They don't even really know what they want to do to their body. They just know they need to do something. They don't feel good. They don't like how they look, whatever it may be. You need to lose all that weight after the holidays. Exactly. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Right, yeah. So the biggest thing I like to do is get to a really tangible reason of what they're looking to do. Hmm. Sometimes, sometimes I like to tell my clients to get a picture of where they, how they want to look. Oh. Maybe like maybe 10 years ago they would look great and they want to look like that oh. again. So you or really as close to. something tangible, finite that they can go ahead and say. I saw an example. Women tend to say, "I want to lose weight," hmm. but they don't go ahead and specify if they want to lose fat versus weight because you can lose. 10 pounds and have five of that be muscle and a lot of times women don't really you need to go ahead and hold on to the muscle you have you really just want to lose the fat you have overlaying some of those areas that those problematic areas as women like to say 
when, when you mentioned the pitcher, I actually heard somebody say that you should like put a pitcher on your refrigerator. Yeah, well, I mean, what you want to look The like. biggest thing that I've had success with with my clients is really finding a way to get that, keep them in it, mentally having, when you train, it's not a matter of going to a gym and just going, doing 25 crunches three times and, you know, following a routine, that's great. It's when you're outside the gym, you have to have a commitment to that. It's not something where it's a miracle. You can go to the gym four times a week and then, how great, I'm going to be in shape. You need to be eating correctly. You need to be going ahead and keeping in mind that you're on. But how do you do that when they're not there? I mean, when you're not there with them, you know? I, I just, I guess I'm just very, very lucky that when I go ahead and start my clients off, I was my personal training manager at a gym I worked at back in New York. He really did a good job of helping me hone in on my craft of educating my clients. And a lot of times some personal trainers don't really get into what they're doing to their clients and how it's going to affect their body and what the overall goal they're going to do and the progression that they're going to take. I make sure my first session is always a free consultation to go through some vitals, put them through some exercises that we were going to touch on later, and really explain to them that this is a plan. This is a strategic plan that we're going to go about for the next two, four, six months of where we're starting, where we're going to go, and that I actually have a vision of what we're going to be doing as opposed to just, oh, okay, today we're going to do squats and you know throw some stuff together on the cuff. Sometimes so you have your game kind of plan that. in advance. And you're able to keep people though motivated for the long run. Or I, the my, I'm very when I do personal training, I am very personal in it. I like to send my my clients. I send them reminders of stuff they should be doing. So, for example, mm -hmm. my service is called Train Anywhere because we can go anywhere, and a lot of times I go to people's homes. Oh. So, for example, someone I always tell my clients to warm up before I get there because I don't need to watch them warm up. I don't want to waste their time or their money. They can go ahead and walk around mm -hmm. around the apartment or you know, go for a jog on the street before I get there for 15 minutes to get the ready when I get there, they'll be ready to go. You can send so them a little text reminder. I send them a text message, like, yeah. say, hey, you know, hey, Laura, you need to be exercising. It's, you know, I'll be there in 30 minutes. You should be stretching right now. Do they ever email you back, uh, go fly a kite? Or no, <laughs> no, they won't do that because they know eventually when they get into the room with me, we start training, I'll remember about that. <laughs> I'll get back on them. I hear you were motivating uh, Christina Perez back there. You know, I wanted to make sure I was on my game when I came out here, so it was a good way instead of just going through it mentally, I was able it to gave go ahead and pointers. gave her some pointers, kind of go over some of the things we were going to do today. A lot, of, a lot of times, someone that's exercising, I guess that really what it comes down to is some people fall into different categories. There are people that were, the I example of myself, I was a Division I athlete, I played football in college, so I have exercise knowledge background where someone may never have played a sport yep. and they want to just realize they don't really know what to do in a gym. Or they do they know how to, they were once in shape but now they just don't have that motivation they had once yeah. before. So it's finding what group you fall in, where you are currently in your current physical fitness and your health, what your goals are and where you would like to be. And really it's about creating a feasible goal to get to. You know what I mean? I like to go ahead and tell my clients. I always tell my clients in that same consultation, before we do that consultation, I send them a form to fill out hmm. that tells them information that I'm going to need. Other than the specifics. So what, what, what kind of things in general do you ask for? The, 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 in tying what we're saying, goals short-term, medium, and long-term goals. So just, Specifically, short-term goals something we're going to do within three months. Medium goals something we should do within six months, and long-term is something we're going to do within a year. Yeah. And coming up with goals that are f actually achievable. So for example, a woman might say, well, I want to lose 20 pounds in two months. It's not that it's not doable, but to do it the correct way, to do it appropriately so that you lose the weight, it stays off. I heard the ahead. finger down the throat works. Yeah, that's, oh, I don't really promote that. No, no, <laughs> and okay. I don't, that wouldn't be a good idea. But um, you really want to go ahead and just make it something that you can do. If you can do it and really achieve it, it should be motivating, but not something that's unreachable. Because then if it's unreachable, you're going to fail at that, and then you're going to feel like training isn't worth for you, and you're going to be back to where you so started. You just, yeah, so I can see that. You could, if you try too much, then you just right. To really Give make sure you educate them. On and what about what metabolism? Into. You hear a lot about metabolism. You, know, you have a high metabolism, a mm. low metabolism. You know, it's a cliche, but it's, it really is true. You are what you eat. You know, mm. someone that's deciding, like example, the woman that wanted to lose weight, it's a matter of how much, you know, what you're taking in, how much you're taking in, and understanding what your daily activities are. Because you need to know what's called your caloric expenditure. Oh. You need to know how many calories you're burning every day so that way you know how many you should be taking in. And how, many, how many calories do you burn every day? Uh, you know, I'm pretty active. I'm always on my feet and I'm always, you know, training my clients, which is a lot of demonstration, a lot of, you know, 
actually having to go through and do some exercises. So I would say I'm probably around 3,500. 3,500. Yeah, really. probably maybe even closer to four, depending on how I train very hard. So it really depends. Because I'm always amazed when you hear about like those athletes, like you know Michael, Michael Phelps, Phelps or yeah. Lance Armstrong or something, who's like burning about thousands and thousands and thousands of calories. That just yeah, and swimming. I mean, I hadn't swam in a while, and I tried to add it back into my program, and I felt like a rock. So <laughs> definitely something to get back into, and that definitely burns a lot of calories. But um, yeah, it's just a matter of just educating yourself on knowing when you should be eating things and what you should be eating and everybody's specific so one of the things I do is I have a nutritionist on staff that I actually oh. put my clients in touch with so that way they can get some general broad knowledge and some of them decide they want to stick with her and get some specifics get a diet plan created and they follow up with her via but it's really specific to each person it's everything specific to everybody because you have different hereditary backgrounds you have different you know things that might affect you different nationalities are diff you know prone to eating different types of food that you're just as part of your culture you do. I'm Italian I would eat a lot of pasta Spanish people you I must be rice. part of Italian because I love pasta it's pretty good <laughs> and, and that's the other thing too about the metabolism people think they have to give up everything that they want to eat and everything they like to eat it's not a matter of giving up that it's a matter of paying attention to what you're eating when you're eating it how much you're eating of it and you know every once in a while you want to have a little ice cream that's fine as long as you take that into account on the rest of your day did you you know you might want to go ahead and eat a little less of something else and make sure you're getting enough meals really what it comes down to a lot of times especially with women they end up not eating enough really not yeah, enough not enough because at, what happens is when you starve your body, you, everybody usually waits till they're hungry to eat. But your body's primitive, so when you go ahead and do that, when you ingest that food, it stores as much as it can as fat because in warning off that happening again. So if you go ahead and, like, example, like, you, you know, you get really busy with the show and you don't eat again until later on that day, which is obviously, I know, <laughs> that'll happen. As soon as I leave, I've got to go eat. Exactly. And you'll take in a big meal because you're starving and then your metabolism can't get to it. You kind of want to think of your metabolism like a fire. You want to constantly keep little logs in that burning so that your metabolism burns throughout the entire day. So as you eat and ingest meals of appropriate size, it can get to it and get the nutrients it needs and get rid of the waste it doesn't need as opposed to having a bunch of food just sitting in your stomach. I have, actually have to watch a little bit because sometimes when we are done taping, I'll be like, I just did two shows. I think I deserve a little reward for right that. Right after you get done talking <laughs> to a personal trainer and a fitness aid. <laughs> I need somebody to text me and say, don't do it. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what I like to do. I like to keep them on that and take care that they uh, know what they're doing and paying attention to it. So oh, right. You're going to demonstrate something for us here really quickly? Yeah, really quickly. Oh, I'm going to go ahead. Here, one of the, yeah, one of the things I like to do is I always tell my clients, one, two, three. It's a one, two, three trick to get them in shape and get them ready to do their exercise. Because uh -huh. breathing is very important and technique is what I harp on the most. So one thing that I like to tell them is the one, two, three trick is to take a deep breath and then pull their belly button to the smaller back with a little bit of tension. Suck not, it in. Not, not too much, <laughs> just a little bit. And that puts you in your natural anatomical state so you'll be here because your body actually has that curvature that you want to keep as if you see the skeleton. And the other thing too you want to maintain is you want to go ahead and keep three points of contact here with this uh, the stick here. Oh. Now that's your natural anatomical state. So oh. whether I have put you through any exercise, so for example, spread your feet shoulder width apart. Okay. Okay, bend your knees a little bit. And now lean forward as if you're going to do a, what's called a bent over row. So you're going to lean <laughs> over forward about here. Probably about maybe like a 45 idea, inches, okay. like 45 degree angle, excuse okay. me. A little bit more. See, you see what you're doing already? You're losing that contact with those three points, wow. and that's what's going to end up affecting your exercise. So I better practice walking around with a bar all day, is that what you're telling me? <laughs> it's a little more in-depth than that, but you just little, little pointers and little tricks to keep people in mind to go ahead and critique their form about what each exercise they well, do. Well, thank you very much, John, for being here today. My pleasure. Personal trainer. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.